it, I appreciate you all having me this morning and appreciate you all being interested in talking about environmental justice at, uh, um, on a Saturday morning. So, um, so this is awesome. So, so I was really asked to give a little bit of an overview of environmental justice and the history of environmental justice from a national perspective. So Fitz will be talking more about what's happening there. But I in Kentucky, but I will um, be talking from just kind of giving a bit of a history of the environmental justice movement, um, keeping in mind that I um, that I that I'll be talking about it from the perspective of the of the folks who are leading the environmental justice movement and and really uh, channeling their voices um, as as the leaders of that of that movement. So just really respecting the fact that I'm in, in fact telling someone else's story. So, so first I wanna just say that environmental justice started before there was ever a time, a term called environmental justice or a movement called the environmental justice movement. Um, it, it, it really, in, in the United States, it started before it was the United States. It started with the, this notion of the founding of, uh, of this, this place that's now called the United States, the, the, and the way it was done in terms of, of driving people away from, from their lands, um, murdering, displacing people, and, um, and really just the, the, the principles and practices of exploitation and domination, which, which really formed the, the basis for the, the economy that is based on enclosure of wealth and power for a few through exploitation and domination of, of others, particularly BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities. So when we talk about this historical contact, context of rampant extraction and exploitation of both human and natural resources, we, we you know, we start with uh, the um, the original occupation of these um, lands or unceded territories. We talk about the fact that Africans in the United States, African Americans, um, were you know were taken from our our ancestors were taken from the motherland, boarded as cargo and in ships, and then brought here to be the enslaved labor that built so much of the infrastructure of this nation. And then we also have the and and it was predicated on the notion that that there's an inverse relationship in, in terms of wellness that persists to today um, in terms of this notion that in order for people to have wealth and power that they were seeking, that they had to oppress and um, suppress and exploit and displace others. And so we saw that both with human resources as well as, as natural resources and the violent extraction of, of natural resources to, to power the nation and, and otherwise. And then we saw this institutionalized in the trade, manufacturing, finance, labor policies, the lack of environmental regulations and protections and so forth with disregard for human and uh, and earth rights. And so from there, kind of fast forward, um, we have the, the rise of the environmental justice movement. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King said, I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few. And I really want to, before kind of starting to tell the story, I want to make sure that we have images of so many of the mavens in the environmental justice movement. These are the ones that we know whose names are, are often um, um, part of the regaling of the stories, but also we know that there are the many, the many communities on the front lines of the struggles in, in, at, at grassroots level. So Dr. Beverly Wright, Tom Goldtooth from Indigenous Environmental Network, Bernice Miller-Travis, one of the co-founders of WEAG, Bob Bullard, Dr. Bob Bullard, um, Pam Lee Tao, um, Charles Lee, um, Hazel Johnson, Paul Mohai, uh, Winona, Winona LaDuc, Richard Moore, Peggy Shepard, um, Manuel Pastor, Donnell Wilkins, um, Bunyan Bryant, just to name a few of the, the giants on whose shoulders um, we stand in this movement. Um, and so when we talk about the movement, you know, as I quoted from Martin Luther King, um, we have, you know, everything from starting with uh, Martin Luther King going to Memphis to support the environmental economic rights of the striking garbage workers to the Houston, um, the Houston case around the, the waste facility there to the, the, the really the situation that real, that, um, 
that 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 formed the the that that really is kind of the one that people think of when they think about the the formation of the environmental justice movement, which was the whole issue around the PCB landfill in North Carolina, where black communities really were targeted by the private and government entities. And so we see that kind of then, and we see the same very the very same thing today. And I'll tell I'll tell a more recent story that I, that I'm dealing with now, where uh, a community was targeted by both private and government entities, and is being displaced as a result. But just sticking with the history. So, you know, the siting of the landfill in a mostly Black community, we see that um, persisting in terms of the siting of landfills, the, the, the civil disobedience that happened um, and um, and the the and the um, government account of, uh, the general accounting office that that really was able to 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 uh, document and uplift the fact that this is not just a one off situation that there was a pattern of racism and the siting of um, of hazardous landfills. So um, so this is another report during that time that also kind of documented the. Uh, the the way the, the ways that that there was intent um this was a this is a a, a firm that was commissioned to evaluate where they should place trash incinerators in california and they actually documented the fact that uh, who was least likely to resist the, the siting of the trash incinerators. And as a result, they, they chose places based on who was least likely to resist um, the, the, the siting. And so this, this oh, are we still, okay. This is a foundation of, uh, of, of uh, a situation that has persisted um, over, over time in terms of how they choose um, where they're going to site these facilities. Um, in 1987, the the uh, the um, the United Church of Christ uh, commissioned the the uh, Toxic Waste and Race Report um, under uh, Dr. Benjamin Chavis, and um, and and of course found that race was more of a factor than class in the in the geography of hazardous waste disposal facilities. Um, since then, Dr. Robert Buller uh, found that an African American in his studies found that an African American family making fifty thousand dollars a year is more likely to live next to a toxic facility than a white American family making fifteen thousand dollars a year. That uh, um, yeah per year. So these are the types of uh, ways that we see that you know, a lot of times people will will conflict and say poor black communities or poor communities, but it's really, uh, and it is definitely disproportionately in terms of lower income communities, but also even above income race is the factor in terms of the siting of, of toxic facilities. So another survey, oh, sorry about the, you, yeah, you wouldn't believe what this is supposed to look like, but so this, is a, this is definitely a, a formatting issue. But but this was another kind of study by another uh, research firm, Epley Associates, where they they looked at each of these areas and characterized them by being affluent. Or um, or by being a distressed area and so forth. And then they they cited which based on this the, these characterizations um, and and they and based on this they kind of would say you know in for the places that where you see in bold residents residences of get a search and and uh, a search and replace for minority and native BIPOC, but um, forgot to do it in places where it's actually history. But um, so residents of, uh, of site of, 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 in that case, it was minority owned, um, very depressed areas, trailers everywhere. Those are the places where they put in, in terms of that's where they should put the nuclear waste facilities versus fairly affluent. That's where they, that's where they put out, you know, in terms of not citing the sites, the things there. So these are the types of the, like literally institutionalizing the pollution and the oppression of, of, of the, these communities. And so we, in 1991, there was a, the first uh, National People of Color Summit, the Environmental Justice Leaders Summit, and um, where they redefined this notion of environment, which of course before was 
defined more by the, the conservationist. And so they re redefined it as where people live, work and play, as well as kind of this, this larger notion of ecosystem systems, flora, fauna and so forth. And so there they put together the the 17 principles of environmental justice, um, which, you know, which are, are are timeless, evergreen um, principles. And so I'm not going to go through them all, but I'm putting them here and hopefully you'll have access to this afterwards, but it affirms the sacredness of Mother Earth, demands public policy be based on mutual respect, um, demands uh, the kind of responsible use of land, demands universal protection from, from everything from nuclear and other hazardous facilities. Um, fundamental rights to economic, social, um, um, uh, services uh, and you know allowances um, right so respects rights rights of workers um, really looks at kind of procedural justice in terms of decision making and participation um, the right to to, re to compensation for um, after injustice and um, affirms the universal declaration of human rights it recognizes the legal and natural relationship of, of, of indigenous people um, through the and really affirms the treaty rights and um, so forth and so on. So um, again, I will uh, share share these with you. I mean, hopefully through the, uh, through the through the organizers. And so these are just some other um, kind of critical points in the history in terms of 1997 Louisiana Energy Services talking about uranium um, enrichment and again site talking about the site selection there where it was found that there was a disproportionate siting of of these um, of these uranium facilities in um, in in areas where the the black population was highest, and then kind of starting to look at at systems a little bit more as well. Um, this uh, this report exposed the corporate propaganda systems that literally undermined um, um, systemic change and and activism. Um, which you'll see more of, uh, just giving you a high level view. Um, it was also kind of critical when in 1990, the, some of the frontline EJ groups, including Richard Moore and um, Pat Bryant of the Gulf Coast Tenants Organization and, and Richard Moore of the um, Southwest Organizing Project really challenged the big greens on their policies and their lack of diversity. So we know recently there was a green 2.0 um, that came out, but they were back in 1990, they were also, challenging so too little has changed since 1990 when this was first being brought to light um this is just and so in 20 in 24 fast forward to 20, 24 sorry 2014 this is where they picked up that work that started in, in 1990 um so then 2002 was the second national people of color environmental leadership summit um, which introduced um uh, further principles um, of, of working together. Before there was kind of a democrat uh, principles of uh, principles of you know just kind of foundational principles for our systems and so forth. But these were these um, affirm uh, established principles for actually how we we're going to collaborate together in the movement. Um, Another um, seminal moment in 1991 when Southwest Network for Environmental Justice and Economic Justice wrote a letter to EPA, actually charging EPA with racism, um, really talked about how this notion of environmental equity um, was um, really failing to adequately protect low income communities of color. And, um, and they, they from, from that, they actually changed the Office of, um, of Environmental, the Environmental Equity Working Group to, the, um, to developing this office, um, the Office of Environmental Justice. And so, so this is just some of the things that they were cited with in terms of EPA. Um, taking longer to clean up toxic waste sites in, in, um, in BIPOC communities, that the penalties for, for hazardous waste um, were five times higher in white communities. And, um, and then also that, uh, that the, the Office of Civil Rights rejected or dismissed 95% of environmental justice complaints um, filed between 1996 and 2013. So it's not like this ancient history situation. This is just even in this, within this last decade. Um, and then the amount of time that they take to even respond and deal with, uh, with issues and yes. And so they talk about environmental justice being um, fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people and so forth. And um, 
and really with um but this kind of equity frame is is really the a lot of the foundation of even just of even defining fair but when the whole system is so flawed then kind of equity in terms of the same level of 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 non-protection <laughs> is short of the mark so we really talk about kind of um justice and and so forth and so um so again environmental equity is poisoning people e equally whereas environmental justice is stop stop poisoning all together so um yeah <laughs> And so again, just this is more data emphasizing that race is the most deciding factor in terms of the distribution of toxic facilities, citing Delaware County. Um, and 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 more recently talking about the impact of, of, of the disproportionate placement of of, bur of um of fracking um, um, operations in BIPOC communities and low-income communities. And so we see this in, in all in so many of the in all the different ways that we generate energy, whether it's uh, the uranium mines um, and uranium and nuclear reactors and so forth being disproportionately in BIPOC communities, coal fired power plants, um, coal mining, um, coal to oil refineries, again, disproportionately located in BIPOC communities. A lot of the oil and gas operations, like I said, fracking, gas fired power plants, pipelines are, are threatening communities with worst impacts. And even some of the wars located in, in the Middle East, as well as in, um, in, in parts of Africa, uh, particularly Northern Africa, that uh, so many uh, the military operations are often tied to oil and gas operations as well and whether it's lng um, terminals pipelines refineries and so forth all have outsized impacts on these frontline communities our frontline communities and then similarly with biomass um, and waste incineration disproportionately located in communities with toxic um, and, and and challenging impacts and even the hydroelectric dams, where um, where uh, where indigenous people are being displaced by these dams, and they also release uh, methane as well, which is one of the greenhouse gas emissions that drives climate change. So just to rem remember who who anchored this movement again, just bringing their faces and their um, work forward again, um, just an anchored so much of the history. And when we talk about today, I want to show us this, this brief video, if Amy can pull it up for us um, in the air. Um, in, in this community is in Baytown, Texas, which is um, which is in the Gulf area, which was impacted by Harvey, and it was also um, it was also in the petrochemical corridor, which is a lot of what was, was talked about here. And oh, sorry, the other thing I was gonna, I would say, the image that I showed before, it had um, it, you can go for it, Amy, but uh, the image that I was showing there, what I was about to point out was that you see the people in the image had masks on. But this was this this video was made way before the pandemic, so and you'll see why they're they're wearing masks. This was made like five years ago, six years ago. So thank you, Amy. Thank you so much. One of the principles of democratic organizing, um, the Hamas principles, is letting the people speak for themselves. So usually when I give the presentation I uh, around environmental justice I start with that video because so that people are speaking for themselves but because um because I was really kind of starting with the history then I I started otherwise but but I appreciate um people telling their own stories so we so just kind of wrap not totally wrapping up <laughs> but uh, but starting to wind down a little bit um from history to where we are today, we still, you know, we we see the this continued um, continuation of the pattern of environmental injustice, with sixty eight percent of African Americans living within um, a thirty mile radius of a coal fire power plant, with uh, oil and gas facilities. This this uh, this um, high school where the oil refinery behind them is, is one of five oil refineries within a ten mile radius of that school. And it's a largely Latino um, African-American community where um, 
76,000 coal miners have died since 1968, um, while the National Mining Association, which consists of their employers, have fought against the uh, regulations for coal mine dust that would have protected them. And uh, those very same industries are paying doctors to, to, to um, testify to, to uh, fight against the claims by families who are seeking protections and, and compensation um, under the black, black lung um, um, funds that are available. And so they're paying doctors to say that, no, they didn't have black lung disease. They had some rare strain of tuberculosis that only you know, appears in, 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 um, in coal miners. And so these are the kinds of just uh, devastating and um, egregious acts being, uh, being perpetrated by the people who are employing um, coal miners. And again, it's another instance of essential work, but non-essential workers, like this, seeing workers as being disposable, even though they're doing essential work. So the so the so these health impacts, you know, whether it's black lung disease or it's asthma with um, African-American children being three to five times more likely to enter the hospital from an asthma attack and two to three times more likely to die of an asthma attack. Um, this is just the medicines of one of the um, the kids of some of the folks that we were training as part of our cold-blooded uh, training, where they sent me this image of his medicines that he he relies on to to uh, breathe every day. He is uh, lives two miles away from a coal fire power plant, and they show a picture of him looking on while another child is playing. And they talk about how his limited lung capacity restricts his ability to play like other kids and restricts his ability to go to school like other kids. Either he's at the doctor's office or he's having to stay home because of poor air quality days where it's not even safe for him to venture out. And then we know that if you're living next to a toxic facility, you're more likely to have um, to have lower property values. And we know the property values finances our school system. So we have kids having a hard time paying attention in school because lead is one of the things that comes out of these smokestacks. Kids who are in school, but our uh, kids who are um, out of school because of poor air quality days, and then we have the lower resource schools, which all combine to 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 challenge a child's ability to achieve. Um, and studies show that if you're not on grade level by the third grade, you're more likely to enter the school to prison pipeline. So we see all of this as inextricably um, interconnected. So we talk about disasters on the, um, in terms of the impacts of some of these environmental um, um, toxins that are in our, our, our atmosphere in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions, whether it's the extreme heat that is disproportionately impacting our communities, the disasters, other types of disasters, hurricanes, tornadoes, and so forth, again, disproportionately impacting our communities. Combination of the 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 location of toxic facilities, um, potentially kind of ticking time bombs, as we saw with um, the Fukushima Daiichi plant in um, in Japan, in terms of when you combine like the flooding and the, the tsunami and the and the earthquake and so forth and its impact on that plant, and we see the um, some similar threats with the placement of these facilities in our, our communities. Um, we also know that um, the BIPOC communities, um, particularly African American and Latino communities, are more likely to be in these high risk flood zones, and so um, and we see that in disaster after disaster with those impacts and 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 who who's able to who is dying um, disproportionately in these disasters. Um, so I'm, we only have about three minutes left, so I'm just going to kind of quickly move through, but these are just showing some of the other inequities, whether it's when the folks are lined up to get food. I was struck by this in, in Alabama, where the people on the left were all the white people who were giving out the food, and on the right were all the Black people who were receiving the food, and that just really struck me in terms of who was able to bounce back, who wasn't impacted in the first place. Um, and and the and what we see is uh, how that plays out. And then this is another picture I took of that same site where outside there was a town hall meeting happening, and on the stage were the people from local government, from FEMA, from the American Red Cross. Every last person was white and mostly male, but then lined up at the mic, the people who need people who needed services, who needed resources, who needed information. Every last person at that moment lined up at the mic was African-American and African-American women at that. And so these, 
other types of challenges. And we too, when we look back to the to the founding of this nation and, and fast forward to today, and, and particularly looking at African American women, we know that the, the wealth differentials um, also um, are not only race, but the wealth differentials are a compounding source of vulnerability where an, a white American household is around, on average $171,000 in wealth, African American household on average $17,000 of wealth, of black dollars in wealth. So these are the types of extreme differentials that we're looking at. And then when we talk about race just, just existing, um, living while black is a term that has come to come to um, popularity where pe police are called because a black stu student at Yale fell asleep in a common room. The police were called with two black men in, in having a meeting in Starbucks. The police were called when black women were checking out of their Airbnb that they rightfully went rented. So just existing um, is, a, is a challenge um, um, for, for African-American people. So, and then in the context of disasters, we see how that becomes even amplified to unfortunately fatal effect. On the same day in the Associated Press, they reported two white people wading through chest deep floodwaters after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store. An African-American male doing the exact same thing is characterized as a young man walks through chest deep floodwaters after looting a grocery store in New Orleans. And, and that kind of um, profiling and criminalization is what leads to the shots on the on the Danziger Bridge, which killed families who were just going back to look for food or look for lost family members, unarmed people on the bridge who were who were immediately characterized as being up to no good. And they were they were uh, tried and convicted and death, death given a death sentence that was issued all in the matter of minutes on that bridge. And so when we see all of this um, coming together, we see how um, these environmental justices compound um, for these families and communities on the front lines. And on, in terms of the US being 4% of the global population, but 25% of the emissions that drive climate change, we see how global South nations are being disproportionately impacted, how na uh, com uh, nations in Central America are um, having to migrate because their crops are drying up. And so they're forced to come just seeking survival for themselves, for their children and so forth. And instead of offering refuge, just from a humanitarian perspective, not to mention the accountability and the responsibility we hold for the kind of forced migration, we instead put people, we lock people up in, in cages. This is a quote from Warshan Shire, a Kenyan born Somali poet. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. So we see so many of the forces that drive the situation. The fossil, we put out this report, fossil fuel foolery. Uh, we see the, the, the forces that are driving the, the status quo, the, the uh, suppression of our democracy. I thought kind of deliberating on this, but uh, definitely at some point, I mean, hopefully you'll be able to look. But at, at mid ten, once you get this uh, this video, you'll, see, you'll I mean, this presentation, you'll be able to see it. But these spoken word artists really told the story in a in a compelling way of who's profiting and who's paying um, in terms of disasters and and, and otherwise. And so just ending with the, the, the call to make sure that people are, are leading on these solutions that we know the answers is frontline communities and therefore we need to be leading on addressing environmental injustice. With the strategic framework of shifting from an extractive economy that's talking about that that's rooted in enclosure of wealth and power, militarism, exploitation, um, domination to a living economy that's rooted in caring for the sacred in terms of relationships with each other, relationships with the earth, um, cooperation, deep democracy, principles and practices of regeneration, then we see it happening. Um, so many people are coming together and building the building the new in terms of the world that we need to have. Um, 
reclaiming the land, um, growing our own food, um, coming together, healing heights and green conversations, um, in, in embracing the outdoors and and um, and enjoying the outdoors, doing multi-solving projects, uh, working with formerly incarcerated persons and training them on energy efficiency retrofits and solar um, installations. Um, working to to push back on policies that that threaten our democracy, um, being involved at the from the local level in terms of the zoning boards to the to the regulatory um, conversations with, with um, rulemaking at EPA and and beyond, going to the nation's capital and making sure that policies, federal legislation is moving in our direction with the feminist green new deal integrating the um, EPA hearings at the Chicago and a group of the only group um, all kind of African American group of, of folks at the EPA hearing at the around the reversal of the clean power plant in West Virginia this group of youth who is um, at the UN climate talks in 2015 where they signed the Paris Agreement um, a group of um, HBCU students and other Black students coming together, calling for, for justice for the sake of their present and their future. Um, going to Iceland and visiting the ice caps, which, which melt and end up in the backyards of these coastal community um, youth, which include youth from Mississippi, Louisiana, and Hawaii. They took advantage of a $250 airfare, um, introductory airfare on Iceland Air, to have that conversation again at the UN conference, coming together with the Global Eco Villages Network to, to plant, and, and both figuratively and literally. Um, planting in um, in places like Kansas City. Um, and I'll finally just wrap up with the power of story, the importance of telling our own stories and advancing our own narratives. That's an African proverb, until lions write, until lions write their own history, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Um, Saturday Night Live had a humorous rendition of the same concept where they talked about this headline where it said, hunter thinking deer was dead, um, that was injured as the deer jumped up and gored him. So this was the headline in the local newspaper, Deer Attacks Hunter. But then they said, or as the story was told in the deer community, serial killer injured as victim fights back. And this is the power of narrative and perspective and who is telling the story. So just as we talk about the story, I think the story and our existence and our relationships much must be centered in love. We see we saw the rise of love um, centered in the mutual aid in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. We see the rise of love in reconnecting with the land and, and with each other. And we see the, the, the rise of love being just central to our, not only our survival, but our ability to thrive in, in a new economy that, that uplifts um, the rights of all, including um, um, earth rights. So the quote, ending with a quote from Martin Luther King, we have before us the glorious opportunity to inject a new dimension of love into the veins of our civilization. So thank you so much. That's our email address at the NAACP's Environmental Climate Justice Program. And uh, my Twitter ha hashtags will be evergreen. So thank you so much. <laughs>